that the reader may be no longer in suspense, he will be pleased to remember that we have often mentioned the family of George Seagrim, commonly called Black George, the gamekeeper, which consisted at present of a wife and five children. The second of these children was a daughter whose name was Molly and who was esteemed one of the handsomest girls in the whole country. Congreve well says there is in true beauty something which vulgar souls cannot admire. So can no dirt or rags hide this something from those souls which are not of the vulgar stamp. The beauty of this girl made, however, no impression on Tom till she grew towards the age of sixteen, when Tom, who was near three years older, began first to cast the eyes of affection upon her. And this affection he had fixed on the girl long before he could bring himself to attempt the possession of her person, for though his constitution urged him greatly to this, his principles no less forcibly restrained him. To debauch a young woman, however low her condition was, appeared to him a very heinous crime, and the goodwill he bore the father with the compassion he had for his family very strongly corroborated all such sober reflections, so that he once resolved to get the better of his inclinations. And he actually abstained three whole months without ever going to Seagrim's house or seeing his daughter. Now, though Molly was, as we have said, generally thought a very fine girl, and in reality she was so, yet her beauty was not of the most amiable kind. It had indeed very little of feminine in it, and would have become a man at least as well as a woman. For, to say the truth, youth and florid health had a very considerable share in the composition. Nor was her mind more effeminate than her person. As this was tall and robust, so was that bold and forward. So little had she of modesty that Jones had more regard for her virtue than she herself. And as most probably she liked Tom as well as he liked her, so when she perceived his backwardness, she herself grew proportionably forward. And when she saw he had entirely deserted the house, she found means of throwing herself in his way, and behaved in such a manner that the youth must have had very much or very little of the hero if her endeavours had proved unsuccessful. In a word, she soon triumphed over all the virtuous resolutions of Jones, for though she behaved at last with all decent reluctance, yet I rather choose to attribute the triumph to her, since, in fact, it was her design which succeeded. In the conduct of this matter, I say Molly so well played her part that Jones attributed the conquest entirely to himself and considered the young woman as one who had yielded to the violent attacks of his passion. He likewise imputed her yielding to the ungovernable force of her love towards him, and this the reader will allow to have been a very natural and probable supposition, as we have more than once mentioned the uncommon comeliness of his person, and indeed he was one of the handsomest young fellows in the world. As there are some minds whose affections, like Master Bliffil's, are solely placed on one single person, whose interest and indulgence alone they consider on every occasion, regarding the good and ill of all others as merely indifferent, any farther than as they contribute to the pleasure or advantage of that person, so there is a different temper of mind which borrows a degree of virtue even from self-love. Such can never receive any kind of satisfaction from another without loving the creature to whom that satisfaction is owing and without making its well-being in some sort necessary to their own ease. Of this latter species was our hero, he considered this poor girl as one whose happiness or misery he had caused to be dependent on himself. 
Her beauty was still the object of desire, though greater beauty or a fresher object might have been more so, but the little abatement which fruition had occasioned to this was highly overbalanced by the considerations of the affection which she visibly bore him, and of the situation into which he had brought her. The former of these created gratitude, the latter compassion, and both, together with his desire for her person, raised in him a passion which might, without any great violence to the word, be called love, though perhaps it was at first not very judiciously placed. This, then, was the true reason of that insensibility which he had shown to the charms of Sophia, and that behaviour in her which might have been reasonably enough interpreted as an encouragement to his addresses. For as he could not think of abandoning his Molly, poor and destitute as she was, so no more could he entertain a notion of betraying such a creature as Sophia. And surely, had he given the least encouragement to any passion for that young lady, he must have been absolutely guilty of one or other of those crimes, either of which would, in my opinion, have very justly subjected him to that fate, which, at his first introduction into this history, I mentioned to have been generally predicted as his certain destiny.' 